record it. Okay. Uh, today, the first exercise is due. <coughs> Your um, comments on the article, it doesn't matter. And I've started to check off the ones that I've received so far. <coughs> if uh, you sent me something and you don't see the check here, then you should let me know. Because I might have missed something in my email. Uh, but also, uh, <coughs> If you're working with somebody, you have to indicate on the on the document who you're working with. I know one one group did that, and then <coughs> you should put your name on. It would be helpful if you put your name on the document, like in writing, in, in the content itself, and also on the name of the document, because everybody hands in the same document and it says exercise one, and then unless I open it up, I can't tell whose it is. Um, and if there's a problem with delivering today, you, you need to send me an email and uh, get permission for a delay. So we'll see what we have by the end of the day. It might take me some time to get through this because I'm going to be away for the next couple lessons. So uh, it will, yeah? Okay. Which your name? Uh, Sign. Sign. Is this yeah. you here? Okay. I'll have to look. Oh yeah, I, <coughs> I wrote it on the paper, but I didn't get it in the document. So yeah. Okay. I have yours. But I need to change it on the other copy, and <coughs> it, it will show up here later. Yes, and by I, I gave the deadline as the 28th. I think I said somewhere in the document that it should be by class time, but I'll. Yeah. Okay. Start like if it's due like before class, by end of day before the workday ends. Yeah. Um, let me see. It's kind of last minute. Yeah, I don't know if I can say it. Well, I mean, you can hand it in by the end of the day. You're not going to get <coughs> immediate feedback on it anyway. So just <coughs> just make it the end of the day. Yeah, I'm already back, so. yeah OK. Um, <coughs> the other thing is um, some people <coughs> answered in English and said it's difficult. But you, you can also write in Norwegian. <coughs> so you can, um, you can decide what you want to send it in. So, yeah. How about the, exam? <coughs> the exam is the same. There will be an official version that I write in English, and then I will get it. I will translate it and get it checked, and um, we'll have a bookmore version as well. So you can reply in English or in bookmore. So. <coughs> All right, so today we'll be talking about um, um, chapter three. We'll start with that. And we have an extra long lecture today, so we can go into three periods. And we'll be also talking about um, co-creation design, which is a note set that I put together and um, is mentioned in the book in chapter two and also in chapter three. And then we'll also talk about, I made an extra note set on ethical issues because chapter three talks a lot about ethical issues. So the, the, the book notes are not that extensive, but we'll go into more detail with these note sets. But we'll start with this one. Okay, um, this uh, chapter 
deals basically with the social context of IS. And uh, it, they say the so social context has to do with politics and economics and culture. And a lot of it is culture and how different types of um, systems and legal systems function, or how IS systems function within these different contexts. Because um, something that works in one political system may not be accepted within another political system, or within one culture uh, may not be accepted within another culture. So uh, these are the factor sets we talk about. And talk about the data privacy and intellectual property rights. And we also have this in the extra set of notes to so go into that in more detail. And then the um, different kinds of ethical issues and how do you manage uh, ethical issues. And they use a case study of Google throughout um, the chapter. Um, OK, <clears throat> before we uh, start talking about political context, uh, the chapter opens up with the case of Google. And uh, it's on page 68 of the book. <clears throat> talk about, uh, first of all, Google started up in 1999. And um, it, when this book was written in 2008, it, had, uh, it was the largest search engine in use and has been continued to be a success. <clears throat> they use a page rank algorithm, which is based on a lot of um, factors. But one of the factors is how many pages point to your page is one that enables uh, pages to have a high page rank. And um, this a page with a high page rank will bring it at the top of a search. Like if you're searching for something, it will be one of the top ones uh, listed so that it's not on page 40 when people search for things. So ideally, like if you're a e business or some kind of, uh, you want to be found when people search, uh, you want to have a high page rank. And in addition to the factors that go into their algorithm, they also let uh, advertisers uh, pay for page ranks to be hit when they um, get hit on. When, when you're searching for certain keywords, uh, then the advertisers' <coughs> pages are more likely to be at the top because they have paid for this placement. <coughs> so these are different types of mechanisms used by Google. And I mentioned in the case study that um, in order to operate in other countries, like China, for example, they had to make an agreement with the country in order to prevent certain types of information to be found on the Google search. And some <coughs> people thought this was uh, not right, that it was an infringement of freedom of expression. And uh, this is something that is not uh, not unethical <coughs> within the Chinese government and within the Chinese culture. So um, this was a case of Google <coughs> complying with government requirements in order to do business within that country. Okay. So uh, then the uh, chapter opens with uh, what is political context. And political context is um, when governments decide the rules of markets. So in cases like uh, telecommunications, for example, uh, a government might support a monopoly in the market for a while. And then after some period, the market or the government might change its regulations and say, OK, now we have to support competition in this market. This is the case that happened in the US telephone market. At first, the government was supportive of a monopoly. But then after a while, the government made legislative changes to allow competition to come into that market. <coughs> so governments will always control how companies can do business. They will set the framework or the rules for which 
companies can operate, even in terms of what types of information technology can be exchanged between governments. There used to be a ban on trading technology with, um, with Russia, for example, and other Eastern Bloc countries. And that, of course, doesn't exist anymore. But there has been times when the government has prevented or shaped uh, how businesses could uh, function. And then they took it in the book about the actions of the government in Europe in terms of uh, addressing Google as a competitor because Google is such a popular search engine. They also wanted to be able to not make all the information or access to information controlled by what is uh, originally an American company. So they talked about uh, archiving information in libraries. And uh, that was also another one of the case studies they talk about the French government archiving uh, the information in libraries. So uh, specific actions that, more, that <laughs> government policy can direct are things like uh, encouraging the, or discouraging the citizens' use of the internet. Uh, they can also enact legislation to protect data privacy and intellectual property. And they can create regulations that affect competition between companies. So these are things that governments can control. <clears throat> OK, um, also on this, they don't have very many slides in this. So also, this is also part of the political uh, section. On page 71, there's a continuation of the case study it's called Microsoft, Yahoo, and Google. And it says that in 2008, that Microsoft uh, bid to buy Yahoo. And that Google objected to this because um, uh, they felt that this would be uh, too much control over this uh, sector. And uh, then the, the, but if you look up on Wikipedia about Yahoo today, you'll see that, um, <coughs> that they had turned down the Microsoft bid. The Microsoft bid like 44 billion, I think it was billion, maybe it was million. But they, they, build, they bid quite a bit. And uh, they were turned down. It also says that in uh, July of 2012, the former Google executive, Marisa Meyer, uh, named, was named as Yahoo CEO. So even though Google was objecting uh, to this merger between, or this buyout of Microsoft uh, buying Yahoo, uh, it turned out that the ex-CEO of Google became the next uh, employee of Google executive became the CEO of, of Yahoo. But uh, of course, she's no longer with Yahoo, but she brings some of the expertise from Google to Yahoo. <coughs> and then it was confirmed in July of 2013 that uh, Google had surpassed, I mean, that Yahoo had surpassed Google on the number of visits to its US websites. So rather than diminishing in its um, importance, it seems that Yahoo is actually mo more healthy today than it was at the time when uh, Google was first gaining its strength. So Yahoo is still doing well as a competitor to Google. And it can be that different search engines raise and fall in popularity in different regions. So there is a different search engine, and I can no longer remember the name of it, but in China they have another search engine that is not Google, something else. And the reason that people use this search engine is because it's oriented towards the Chinese language. It has the character set, it has the presentation, and it's, it's suited to that culture. Um, 
Um, also on page 71, they talk about the, uh, the French government, which is also uh, trying to archive uh, its uh, libraries. And it says they're digitizing something like 100,000 items a year. One of the problems with this is that that's one government working on an archiving project. And <clears throat> that cannot compete with uh, the, all of the people that are contributing content to the internet and then are accessible through like a Google search engine. So the, the point is that if you have many people contributing to a service in some way, that this is going to be more powerful than if you have one source con contributing to that content. Uh, they also mentioned that the Japanese government had did, had, was doing similar types of uh, state-led projects that was aimed at overtaking Google. And that Germany also had launched a plan, but then they abandoned this plan. So um, there's different efforts for competition. Um, Uh, on page 72, there's a question, and the activity number is uh, try to find an example of a government action that is affecting the use of the internet. And so I ask you, do you know of any uh, government policies which affect the use of the internet? Can you think of any in Norway, for example? Does uh, the government try to control markets in any way? I could think of... Um, like in, if you think about the, um, the telecommunications industry and who has access to the bandwidth in the, um, the bandwidth for communications, mobile communications, there's, there's, I don't know what the regulations are on this, but there's probably some regulations about which companies can access which bandwidth. I'm, ass I'm assuming that. So um, there is some regulations by the government. It's not like a free entry. It's not like anybody can set up an antenna that's 40 feet high and start broadcasting stuff. So you have to um, find out what the rules are. And then the, it's usually there's some government regulations about that. OK, okay. okay so um, <coughs> the next type of context. So that's an example of political context. The next type of context is uh, the economic context. context. And um, this can focus on <coughs> the customer, for example. And um, usually businesses want to know uh, what something about the customer, what kind of customer they are. And um, So ideally, managers need to know each type of customer for each digital channel and the proportion of customers who have access to the channel in, are influenced by using the channel and purchase using the channel. So again, an example would be uh, people that purchase things on the internet. Uh, how many people are purchasing things on the internet? What are they purchasing and not purchasing? And um, <coughs> how are they making use of this channel? So like, uh, what types of items are they purchasing? Uh, which types of backgrounds do the purchasers come from? So there's enormous amounts of studies that go into looking at the demographics of, of um, <coughs> people that shop things online. And as this has been uh, changing over the years, it's gone from maybe a, a certain group of people that are technologically savvy and have high incomes to being more the general population. So it's becoming uh, more, everyone is buying online and they're buying all types of um, items online. 
So they mention um, in this uh, study, let me just write it on here. Okay, um, so I went to this website. It's in the book on page 73 underneath the, uh, underneath the illustration. It shows that people are uh, increasing their internet subscriptions and are also uh, getting more broadband subscriptions. And it, <coughs> it doesn't really talk about um, specifically uh, what people are purchasing online, but it's more like what types of devices are being used to access uh, the internet. And the big growth in this area it has been now mobile technologies. <coughs> okay, and then they also talk about um, um, that the access to the internet has changed the way people purchase products. And that is that people are spending more time uh, using technology in every part of the buying process. So they're using it to do research on the products. They're using it to compare the products to each other. They're using it in actual purchasing. And they're also using it uh, in following up on service for the products. So in every stage of the customer and, and um, seller relationship, there's been more use of I, ICT in that process. So It, there's also a table on page 74 which shows the variations in the amount of purchases in Europe. And they show the amount of online internet shopping and the average number of items bought online per internet shopper. And Norway is near the top. It's number three on this list. And even though um, they're number three on the list of internet shopping, uh, they would normally be number four on the average number of items bought. So that means that they're actually spending more money per item, so they're buying higher cost items. And that this is another trend that uh, as time goes by, people are making um, more expensive purchases. Uh, more personal so the, the trend has been as uh, like before maybe they would buy something that wasn't so expensive um, I don't know a book and then as time or a CD and as time goes by people are making larger purchases like television sets, cars, um, 
yeah, and TVs, things like that. And then the items that are more uh, personal, I don't know if I agree with this in terms of classification, but it's, it seems to be like instead of just a generic thing, but something that you might get uh, customized for yourself, I think that's what they mean by this. So they're making more customized purchases. So not just buying a commodity like a book that anyone can buy, but getting something like maybe a car that is, or a, or a PC that's uh, put together to your specifications. Another uh, website that is mentioned is this one. This is the IAA website, and it's the European Interactive Advertising Association, and it surveys uh, different types of all companies and, and states for how much online purchasing goes on. And um, uh, it's a little bit difficult to find <laughs> exactly the data that they are uh, pointing to in this um, in this book because things have changed in their <laughs> setup. But if you go to the website, there's a lot of reports. And some of the reports are white papers and for free. So you can look at those and you can see that uh, what is purchased online now is almost anything. And that um, uh, you can look at patterns by different countries and different markets as well. So you can see what, what, what different organizations, what people are spending money on advertising. So. So you can uh, take a look at that if you like. Okay. Okay. So yeah, they did have this. Um, so this shows the measures of internet access, and of course, this is from 2006. So now it's, it's probably much higher. And the one thing that's noted is that um, if you go to the ITU site, that even though the access via mobile is increase, increasing. The fixed lines are actually going down. So this is going up, and fixed line access is going down. OK, um, <coughs> the next area of context they talk about is culture. And they say culture is a distinct is distinct from human nature, and that uh, uh, it's talking about that the culture is, is from individual, human nature is from individual's personality, and that culture is a collective phenomena. So you say culture. And um, they make a distinction. They, took, they refer to Hofsted uh, studies. And Hofsted created some sort of factors about uh, how different types of cultures are. Like maybe there's uh, some that are very uh, hierarchical and others are not. And that some are um, very, uh, have strong centralized power and others do not. So there's, there's the Hofsted studies where these different types of characteristics 
And they, they basically talk about um, that there's, there's he, they just make a distinction in this book about two types of context. There's a high context culture and a low context. So um, the high context culture is one in which information is implicit and can only be fully understood in conjunction with shared experiences, assumptions, and various forms of verbal codes. Uh, high context cultures occur when people live closely with each other and have a deep mutual understanding that develops, which provides a rich context uh, <coughs> in which uh, communication takes place. And then the low context culture is about ex where information is explicit and clear and cultures where people are physically, so psychologically distant, distant from each other and they also depend on more explicit information to communicate. So these use implicit information is explicit. And they make examples of different types of high context and low context cultures where they say that uh, Japanese, the Arabic countries and Mediterranean people have um, high context cultures and that the um, Northern Europe and US uh, cultures have low context cult culture. So, and this maybe has to do with how people do business. Like if you're in a high context culture, you talk about uh, relationships and trust with people and it's like, I'm not in your family, but you know me. And it's like, uh, so there's sort of like a, unspoken agreement with pe between people about how they do business. And then uh, in the low context culture, this has to be guided perhaps by laws and regulations. So people need to have it spelt out in contracts how they do business. So they're just saying that there's different ways in which uh, these societies work. Okay, uh, and then they talk about social networking sites. And even sites like this, like um, uh, MySpace Dimension or Facebook, these types of sites function differently depending on the cultures in which they're, they're operating. So it may be that um, uh, you're not allowed to post pictures in some social networking sites for certain cultures. So we had a, a project uh, that I was just at a project meeting. And one of the persons at the project meeting was uh, from a Sami culture. And even though the project has pictures up on a public social network site, uh, they didn't want their picture up on the site because they're not allowed to show that in their culture. They had to, I don't know, I don't know the rules about that, but you just have to get the ethical clearance and you have to get permission from people in order to post things on sites. So uh, social networking sites, even though um, we assume that they're open for everybody, they still have to be run by um, sort of a um, an agreed upon uh, standard for protection of privacy and, and uh, whatever is the ethical uh, issues for the participants. It might also be the case with uh, Arabic culture. Maybe uh, some pictures are not allowed of people or of uh, religious figures. So we have to be careful about what is posted on, if we have public software, what is, uh, how this software is used, and it's used differently within different cultures. <coughs> okay. Uh, 
Uh, they also talk about the use of uh, social networking sites. So this was like they were mentioning Facebook, of course. And um, Facebook wasn't even that big in 2007 or 8 when this was first made in MySpace. And then they also talked about things like uh, business social networks. And we have an example of LinkedIn. But also there can be like Facebook groups or LinkedIn. And both of these can be used by businesses to contact uh, people. So they're used not only for social reasons, but they're also used for business reasons. And this could be like uh, recruitment and posting of uh, resumes. The, the other thing they talk about, oh yeah, let me just go back a little bit. Hi. <coughs> on uh, page 77, there's a activity question. Reflect on social networking sites. Reflect on how you use social networking sites and make notes on these questions. So I think this is something we can all do, at least in our minds, we can think about this. Uh, which sites do you use, and are you using them more or less than you did three months ago or one year ago? So think about which social networking sites you use, and are you using them more or less than you did, say, a year ago? So who, who is using them more? Are you using them less? Okay. I'm more active on Twitter. So you're more active on Twitter now and less active on Facebook. So you change maybe which ones you're active on. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Have you done any vines? <laughs> vines. There's like a tap, like an application that's like Twitter only for videos. No. No. Okay. Just, I'm just curious about those. <laughs> They're kind of new. <laughs> hmm. OK, so uh, what is the main benefit that you obtain by using them? What is the main reason you use uh, social networking sites? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. OK. Mm -hmm. But why, why would you use Twitter as opposed to Facebook? OK, so it's not so personal. It's more no, like. Mm, okay, so you have to use them for different purposes, basically. <coughs> okay, um, uh, how does the fact that information you share on so on the site will be visible for many years affect what you post? So, like, once it's out there, you can't take it back. How does that affect what you put on these these networks? Are you careful about posting? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm. And then, uh, but maybe you weren't so careful like five years ago or something like that. Are you more careful now than you were before? Mm. I'm more careful, but just less active. Okay. Mm. Okay. <coughs> Um, do you consider yourself to be a high context or low context culture? And how does this affect the use of these sites? Okay, uh, so are we in high context or low context culture? Is the information, um, do we use implicit information to communicate or do we use explicit information to communicate? Like us living in Norway, in Mori Romsdal, is this high context or low context? Is it low context? Okay. So when you want to communicate with family or 
businesses, you also, you, regardless, you're explicit. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> okay. So yeah, maybe we don't use the social network sites for some communications, like one-to-one -one communications. We might use some other means. Like I use um, I use Viber a lot, and that's just with my family group. And I don't use it. I don't post things on Facebook that I can just say to them. So, yeah. okay. Okay. So, oh. <coughs> the next point they make about culture is that uh, technology is a fashion, and they talk about different types of when Nokia came out with different telephone designs, and uh, even the fact that people were selecting uh, Apple phones. It was it had maybe it's gone down in popularity, but for a while it was a, a fashion statement to have um, a particular type of phone, and um, <coughs> yeah. So you're not only selling products on their function, but also on the way they look, their their fashion. And then um, <coughs> they talk about producing and consuming, and. Um, this is somewhat related to co-creation design, and that's what we'll be getting into in the next uh, slide set very shortly. Um, we have um, different waves of production, the pre-industrial wave of production. Uh, we had that um, uh, people mostly consumed what they pr produced. So this is pre-industrial. So uh, we have people produce <laughs> what they make themselves. And then, then you have uh, in the industrialization. We have uh, goods and services are produced and exchanged. So you have people specializing. Mm. And you have people buying and selling, so you have trade taking place. And then in the third wave, you have um, uh, the distinction is breaking down in many spheres of life, people do more things for themselves rather than rel rely on professionals. So it's like kind of, I guess, post-industrial. example is like searching for professional health, health answers and things like that. So doing searches, creating your own uh, reservations when you're traveling. So they're talking about some sort of uh, people doing some selected things by themselves. Mm. Mm. Okay, and they also talk about customers contributing to the products, like discussion groups contributing to content. And again, we'll go into this more later. Um, before we get to the part on, I think there's, there's still quite a bit more here. So we'll, we'll take a break now, and then after we come back, we'll continue with this. And then we'll start on the next set after. Thank you. 
Jesús.